I wake up and I stand up and something feels weird on the left side of my body. I try to lift my left arm and it doesn't feel like it usually feels. And I go to try to make a fist and I can't make a fist. Like my mind is telling my hand to make a fist and it will not make that fist. And I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why it's happening. I'm like, it's gonna go away. Whatever it is, it's gonna go away. I didn't realize there was something going on with my brain at the time. So that's why I couldn't function on this side of my body. In 1996, my brother passed away of brain cancer. And when he died, I was 13 years old and he was 16 years old. When you don't have insurance, you're terrified in this country. You feel like you're lost, nobody's gonna look out for you. We were poor, there was nothing we can do. I, I always felt like money, money took him away. I didn't know what mass clinic was, but my mom was worried enough to contact the clinic, knew I didn't have any insurance and I wasn't going to the hospital. I would have just, whatever happened to me was gonna happen. And I, uh, I came to mass and uh, that's when I found out that uh, I have lesions on my brain. My brother died of brain cancer. This is gonna to happen to me next. How do I get lesions on my brain? Who put them there? I was terrified. It's still something to be frightened of, but I'm stronger now, like I'm okay. I think things happen for a reason. I think some of us are damaged to be better than we've been. Out of all that I saw with everything that I went through, I didn't even think about how bad I felt. I thought about how dope and great it was to see people help people. And in the beginning, it, it reads as a Muslim clinic. And I thought, well, how am I gonna get in here? But it was all kind of people in here, all kind of. Every culture you could find was in here. And it just, it, to me, it felt like the world was in here and they were getting help. And I felt like that's how life should be. I grew up in Bombay, a slum area of Bombay. It's not like what you see in Bollywood and all. I was the first person in my family who completed the high school. I came to America on the H-1B visa in year 1998. I'm here at the land of opportunities. If you have a value, if you have a skill set, sky is the limit. County, we have a number of issues that contribute to our uninsured problem. The uninsured rate is 12.8%, which represents about 120,000 people. In the state of Florida, we rank 48th in healthcare measures. Since the rollout of the Affordable Care Act, we have seen the rate of uninsured fall but in the state of Florida, we chose not to expand Medicaid. So ACA did not necessarily impact the poorest citizens in the way we might like. And we still have people then who fall through that gap. The poverty rate for Duval County is 14.5%, which represents about 136,000 people. Each and every election, it was the healthcare. That was the buzzword. When I did some research and I saw that, hey, there is a dire need of people who cannot afford the basic healthcare, I put myself in that shoes. I know what poverty is. I have gone through it. How do we care for our population? Do we believe that the, the United States is rich enough and has the wherewithal to provide health care for all citizens? Which means then that we believe health care is a right? Or do we think health care is a privilege? No matter what your political persuasion is, um, what do we do for people who fall through the gap? We have resources in our community. There are a lot of physicians 
and I said, okay, how about we do something? What can our community give back to the country which has given so much? Somehow, I believe we need to make sure that all citizens have health care so that they can become productive in our society. I'm Diane Raines. I am the chair of the Mass Board, and I serve as the Chief Nursing Officer at Baptist Health. I'm Faisal Syed. I'm the Executive Director of Mass Clinic. All right, any other question? All right, thank you, take care, bye-bye. When Brother Faisal wanted me to take care of the office charge, I knew that deep in my heart that I can do it. But I was still a little hesitant because it involves a lot of people from different faith groups before I was just dealing within the Muslim community. If you ask me frankly, in 2010, when this idea came up, it sounded strange to me. I thought in America, everything is good, but still there is a shortage of services. Uh, here we have our uh, volunteer nurses. This is their station where they do all the vital signs, the weights and blood pressure monitoring. Right now, we just have four uh, examination rooms and on a, any given Sunday, this place becomes really crazy. There are people all over. This waiting room gets really crowded and noisy. And sometimes even we lower the AC, it's difficult because there are so many people in this room that it gets really hot as well. Everyone is bringing their own unique skill set to the table to solve the healthcare problem of Jacksonville. I have four primary care providers that are coming in, and then I have four specialty providers. I have cardiology, podiatry, PT, physical therapy, and I have behavioral health going on. So I don't know where I'm going to bring these patients. We have about 70 patients scheduled, and I don't know what's going to go on. Next time, if you get an appointment, you want to bring that in. And it must be filled out, or the doctors will be able to see you. Okay? This clinic is a melting pot. People come in from all walks of life, all cultures, all backgrounds, all religions. Even our volunteers, our doctors, they come in from different hospitals, different countries, they speak different languages, and no matter where everyone is from, they all have the same goal, and that's to help the patients um, have a better quality of life. We are a family here. We work together. Everyone is different. Everyone comes from a different background, but we all work together to get the job done. Everybody want to be there. That love and the clinic and, and the service, it makes a big difference. Our main challenge right now is the space. If we have more exam rooms, we would be able to see more patients with the same number of providers, but there's no more space. We're all like congested in this one tiny office and people moving around all the time. Sometimes it's so hard to navigate through. Every time I come in every Sunday, I see our waiting areas fuller and fuller. We squeeze patients into our schedule. We see 60 to 70 patients uh, on some days. So we have patients in every doctor's room. We put patients upstairs. We have a social worker come in and she sees patients upstairs. So we really make use of every inch of this clinic we do. The lobby is completely full, but the more patients, the better, because we're able to help out more people. So. You can gradually see these people's health get better before your eyes. Three months ago, this person was running into the ER every two weeks to just get refills on medications that they can easily get from like a primary care doctor. One day in the hospital is it's about $1,000. Having a clinic like this, we're saving a lot of money. Because we are a free clinic, we have to be below 200% of federal poverty limit and no insurance. We have so many patients out there that don't have insurance, they don't get treatment because of that. Either they cannot qualify for the government health insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, or they don't have money to get the private. So they're stuck in between. A lot of the people that come here have jobs, but they just don't have health insurance with those jobs. Before working here, I mean, I knew there were people without health insurance, but I really had no idea to what extent. We don't have universal health care in this country, and you definitely see a need for it. 
you start to look at like, okay, what is this country doing for people that are the underserved population? It's definitely our duty to like step up for them, to help them. Last year, we served 1,355 patients through 3,153 doctor's appointments and checkups. We saw an average of 60 patients per week and were only open four days out of the seven. Local hospitals referred 935 patients to us for care, saving an estimated $2.7 million in emergency room costs. This year, we're on track to serve even more patients. This is the place where we started our first clinic in 2010. People used to stand all the way outside. It was a small clinic with only two rooms um, and uh, one nurse. So um, even there was no space at times to stand. My first day, there were about five patients. I saw new breast cancer patients. I saw patients with anemia and liver cancer. This used to be our patient waiting area. So small, it used to get so crowded. The marks are still here for front desk. Yeah, right. <laughs> As you can see. It has grown tremendously in the current building where we are right now. It's um, since 2014, I believe. The volume of patients has grown. Honestly, in my mind, I also had doubt, okay, what happens? How this project is going to go? But people started calling, signing it up for their time, giving the monetary donation, equipment donation, even before we announce the day when we are planning to open. Faisal kind of goes out of his way to help everyone. Faisal Sayed is probably um, one of the biggest influences on my career thus far. For me, it's like the craziest thing ever to think of like, um, like a software uh, engineer just like decides like, hey, I'm going to open a clinic. I aspire to hopefully open my own clinic one day, my own free clinic and um, do the same that he did for me to other students, help them you know, get their foot in the door and find opportunities to reach their goals. When my dad started the clinic, I saw my dad working every day, every night. Even on our treadmill, we have like this little stand where he puts his computer and he works and walks. It's so cute. When I went to my dad's Jacksonville Humanitarian Award, a lot of people approached me and they were just like, how do you think you're gonna fill in your dad's shoes? And it just made me realize that I kind of want to make my life about giving back. I don't respect anyone more than I respect my dad. I look up to him every day. I hope that I like can make him proud one day and I do have really big shoes to fill. So yeah. <laughs> I was laid off from my job because I had missed a lot of time due to my health. I have migraines, I have asthma, I have diabetes, and obviously since I was laid off, I didn't have um, insurance. I was starting to become very unwell with congested heart failure, and because of that, I couldn't afford the Obamacare, and every insurance company that I've called they will tell me that they can cover me, but they cannot cover me for pre-existing conditions. So I said, well, that don't make any sense. I mean, shouldn't you cover me that I should have management, you know, management care, since this is a chronic issue, and not wait until it gets worse? I had been living in Tennessee, um, always worked, and always had health insurance. Moved down here from Tennessee in January of 2000. Um, 17 and I fell and hurt my back before I was able to get a job since then I've had to have heart, open heart surgery um, I am at about uh, six hundred thousand dollars in bills at this point and that's a that's a rough estimate because frankly I stopped counting 
some days I do feel very sorry for my family, you know, because before coming here and being managed, I was in and out of the hospital, in and out of the hospital. Anybody could find themselves in this situation. Anybody, you know. I mean, it seemed like just yesterday we were working, you know, we had health coverage. I never really thought that much about what it was like to not have insurance because I'd always had it. I was never a fan of ideas like national health insurance, single payer, um, always, always voted Republican. But now my opinions have changed on that 180 degrees. I support a single payer health care. Um, I've seen it from the other side now, and it's horrible. This clinic is like a game changer. Instead of being brought down by what's going on, you know, it's being taken care of. Doctors are aware of it. So I feel better about that. I needed to be seen by a doctor regularly. And the Mass Clinic, um, because of the way they do things, I was able to come here and I don't have to worry about bills from them. Um, they can refer me to doctors that volunteer their time. When I found out about this place, this was like mana sent from heaven for me because they were able to run all the necessary tests. You know, at that point, they're able to do all the follow-ups with me. I try to thank them when I think about it. You know, thank you for volunteering here because I know if they didn't volunteer, then I wouldn't have a place to go. Now my heart has become a whole lot more stable than it was before. Honestly, the mass clinic has saved my life. It's a shame that these folks have to donate their time to fill that gap. It is a big gap and it's getting worse. And I don't see another alternative. You know, you, you, you fell down and that was just a cascade yeah. of all this health stuff. Now, you know, the, the insurance thing is just, it's just a kick in the teeth. I mean, it pisses me off and it's not happening to me. Well, so I can well, only imagine is, what it's- It is happening to you because you have to pay that. There are times when I know that Scott is, that they're very low on money. You know, maybe it's the off pay week or whatever, and I'll do without insulin. I have had to do that. And I don't say anything if I know that you're short on money. There are times when uh, my wife and I are extremely low on money and, you know, I'll, I, we'll find a way, and it, it, it irritates me when he does that. And I think going without your insulin is kind of is kind of dumb. And if you run out of it, tell me, and we'll make it work. We'll figure it out. You don't have to go without. If it weren't for like the mass clinic, you know, I I, I really think that they would saved your life. It's a bad situation that we have to have a thing like that. But I'm grateful that we do. Like, they are putting their money where their mouth is, literally. They're, they're doing what their book says. This is surveillance video of the man suspected of setting off an explosion at a local mosque. The bombing happened six months before the clinic opened. The bomb was like placed right next to the main hall, and then we just heard the huge blast. Me being a 10-year-old, going with that thought in my head that someone had this hate in their heart. Like, should any 10-year-old in this country have to go through that thought? That, am I safe in this country? Especially after the mosque got bombed, my biggest fear is that someone is going to come into the masjid and just like start shooting. And that's like, I wake up and I think about that a lot. The kids were totally terrified because for us and the kids, the Islamic center is a second home. Do we need to stop our kids from even going to our religious places? Because other than home, that's the only place where we can teach them about our religion. If that place is also not safe, then where can we go? I was, first of all, just very shocked that there was someone so hateful towards, you know, me and my people. And it's tough that I've been taught that that's just something I have to deal with.
America is always going to fear what they don't know. And they haven't taken the time to know Muslims. They haven't taken the time to understand Muslims. And I feel like once they get to know who we are, get to know what we do, they'll understand that our goal in life is also just to better America. What should be the reaction of a Muslim? Of a true practicing Muslim? We come with great intentions to help others and to serve our purpose and, you know, to show people that despite all of the negative attention towards Muslims, we're not, you know, we're not bad people. If someone has hate in their heart for my religion, I definitely think I could persuade them out of it. And why is because of this clinic. This is our way of showing the world that this is what Muslims do. This is what Muslims are actually about. I've pretty much gone to church all my life. My mom took us to church every Sunday, um, went to Sunday school, and I currently go to Southern Baptist Church at Deer Meadows Baptist. Um, thank you so much for this evening. Yeah, thank you. When I tell people where I work and what I do, I do have to explain it. I have to say, no, it's not just for Muslims, it's for anybody who needs health care. So if you need something, let me know, I can get you in. Next thing I know, I'm getting a text or something or a call, hey, my friend needs some help. Is there any way, you know, what do I need to do to get them in there? When I first started working here, I struggled with it a little bit. I loved the clinic because of all the good they were doing. Everybody was very, very nice here. Um, but as a Christian, a lot of times you get told, you know, you shouldn't be involved with it, you know, things of other religions and stuff like that. The pastor asked me what I did and I told him, he's like, that is so great. I think that is so great that, that you work at a Muslim clinic. That's the way it should be. We should work together. The job that we're doing is not about religion. It's about helping people. As a Christian, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, is helping people. What are the two great commandments? Love God, love your neighbor. Every single uh, religion is based on uh, empathy, loving one another, taking care of one another. As a community of faith, uh, the embodiment of your faith is to be a blessing to other people, to give your life away in order to make uh, other people's lives better. If you go through the book, you will uh, get, okay, uh, serving humanity, fulfilling their basic need is why religion uh, came on, on earth. Not only do we express love to others, but to all others. Everyone is our neighbor. If you want to get closer to God, if you want to have salvation, this is the route. Serve people. We're all hurting in some type of way. It's unfortunate that it takes that for us to come together. But in this room, I saw every walk of life. I didn't expect to see more black people coming through the door. I see black, I see Asian, I see white people coming through the door. These people probably never thought that they would be at the hands of Muslim clinic. In the Quran it says not help the Muslim, it says help any human being. It's just our basic goal to serve humanity. You just got to give people a chance. I didn't want people to see that I'm coming into a Muslim facility, you know, but coming here I realized this is a great place and, you know, it's somewhere that is mistaken so much because as soon as we see the word Muslim, we automatically put our defenses up. In the Quran, it says to give back and that's charity is a God. I feel like I'm fulfilling that every day working here. 
and I feel like a better and a stronger Muslim when I do so. We all make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. It's a blessing for us to be there in a place where you're able to give back. Whether it's the Muslim faith or the Christian faith, they all talk about charity. These folks are putting that to work. This is a community that could close these doors and only take care of their own, but they've chosen to open the doors and they don't care what color you are, what race, what religion you are. Being a physician is a blessing. God has given me a gift of education. This gift of education I can only pay back by helping people who cannot afford treatment. I am I'm just a vehicle who is helping his creation. If I compare with my past, I have everything. When I was going to the college, I had two cents in my pocket. If you compare it, it was one rupee. I was so hungry that I couldn't even take one step. And of course, I have to walk home. I go to the restaurant. I saw next person ordering a rice. And on that rice, he put a little bit curry. And I asked the waiter that, okay, how much is it going to cost? He saw the need in my eyes. And he said, that, you know what? This comes free. And I ordered that. Drank a lot of water and walked home. That's real Faisal. I'm very thankful what I have. And I see at second moment, I can be on the other side. God says that, hey, if you have, give back to the people who are in need. And that's what we at Mass are doing. When we started the clinic, I had it out. But the community was so supporting that we are here in now almost 10th year. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something to happen, regardless whether you are there or someone else is there, it happens. And I'm sure that after I'm gone, there will be people who will just step out and say, okay, let's take it to the next level. The need in our city is just a small piece of the need in our country. But Mass is not alone. Muslims have opened nearly 100 clinics in 26 states across America. Together, we are treating tens of thousands of people. Everyone is trying to pitch in a little bit, a small, small parts. And that's creating the whole ocean, small drops. Now I'm the one who can say, this comes free.